my nails. <laughs> Not on me today. No? I'll stick them in. Hey. Admit it, you came for the pizza. <laughs> oh, there's pizza? I actually didn't even know there was pizza. <laughs> He's one of our officers, so. He is. Yeah. He. Alright, whenever you're ready to go. Whenever I'm ready to go, I'm just going to go. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Jeff Stiller, and I feel a bit hazy from the drive out here. You saw the weather? I mean, it was sort of like hours and hours and hours of this gray haze. All the distant landmarks didn't exist. Anything that was at some distance from the road was ethereal, nothing real. It was almost like a metaphor for working your way through life. It's working your way through this fog, this ever-present fog. And then I got off I-90, and I turned onto the road that takes me to the U, and suddenly, boom, there was this big blue sky, and I thought, this happens to you guys all the time, doesn't it? Here. <laughs> well, welcome to uh, our little chat here. And thank you very much for having me. The, um, why don't we play it like this? I will tell you a story. I've bored you already? That's awful. I will tell you a story about a pebble in my shoe and how it turned in to the fullest expression of meaning in my life. And after that, we'll get to the really good stuff. Your questions and my answers, okay? So this pebble started when I was very, very young. I was about 10 or 11, and my family was going through uh, some very hard times. And I decided, in 10-year-old fashion, with that limited reasoning capability that I had, that I needed some serious assistance. I needed the big guns. I needed God. So I went looking for God. Now, as you can imagine, as a 10-year-old, my sphere of operations was pretty limited. However, I had a paper route. So I decided, in 10-year-old fashion, that God must be somewhere on my paper route. And so I began my search. Now, plot spoiler here, I did not, in fact, find God on my paper route. I'm just going to lay that out there right now. But I did meet some interesting people. For example, a local priest who said, you don't have to become a Catholic. I hope you become a Catholic. But you don't have to become a Catholic. But here's what I do want. I want you to be a good man. No pressure. Mm -hmm. And then my scoutmaster, a few years later, whose take on it was completely different. Which church? I don't care whether you go to church at all. But here's what I do want. I want for you to become a good man. So this whole thing about becoming a good man sort of got folded into my search. And I began to notice this little pebble in my shoe because I wasn't very successful at it. This search for God, this, this, this mounting need, this urgency to figure out how... God works. What makes God tick? What are the rules? You know, how to get a handle on God? And I sort of made myself in teenager fashion. I'm sure you did this too, right? I made myself an expert in Christianity. And, but, you know, I skipped over all the snarky parts, like, you know, where did Cain's wife come from? I went for the big stuff. I was just really interested in that. Like, so tell me about this sin stuff. And then... The crucifixion thing, run by, run that by me again, so everybody gets washed free of sin, so that occurs like how, like with a garden hose? And <laughs> some ministers were um, gracious about it, and some were not quite so gracious about it. I thought I was really charming and witty. I'm sure, looking back now, it was probably pretty tedious. But hey, we've all been there, right? Teenage, right? By the end of my teen years, the, the pebble was becoming a bit of a stone in my shoe, and I was getting a bit frustrated. You know, I figured I was 18, I was graduating high school, I know pretty much everything there is to know about Christianity, so I decided, you know, when I got to college, to do something completely different. It was college, right? You remember college, that awful spring of your, you know, last year in high school, where everybody, everybody, like the guy down at the grocery store, the, the woman at Starbucks, right, the, your next door neighbor, and your aunt, they're all asking you the same question, so what are you gonna study? What What's your major going to be, right? And so we all say something practical, like business, yes, yes. And then like three minutes later, 
you know, you're studying something like art history or English lit or, you know, because that's college, it just happens. Well, I went into classical Chinese culture. Why? What, I don't, what does a white boy from Wonder Bread, Wisconsin know about classical Chinese culture? Nothing, but it's, it's college, right? It just bit me, bit me hard. So I went into Chinese religions. I went into classical Buddhism, you know, such as uh, the sutras, tussling with the sutras, like the, uh, the Heart Sutra, which is very short. It's also very abstruse. It's about formlessness and the void. Yeah. And the Lotus Sutra, which is very, very long, which is basically says that Buddha is God, so if you get into a jam, pray. Or the Flower Sermon, which is so short that uh, Buddha doesn't say anything at all. He just pulls up a flower, looks at all of his disciples and waits until one of them goes and smiles. Right? So just like that, tussling with that, or, or the Chan tradition, how the development goes through the Bodhidharma all the way through the various patriarchs to Huinan, who's considered, you know, arguably the, the greatest of the Chan teachers, and his emphasis on guided thinking, guided thought. Right? If that sounds odd, imagine this. When's the last time this happened to you? You're driving down the street, and you see that fast food restaurant with a big banner and that big juicy burger on it that says, one dollar, and you think, I need that dollar juicy burger. And then you look down and you go, maybe I don't need that guided thought, guided thinking, right? And how his thoughts came on to uh, sort of, uh, well, no, it did. It directly affected Asai and Dogen, the two founders of the, respectively, the Rinzai and Soto Zen schools in Japan. Boy, do they ever disagree, right? Classical Buddhism, also a little bit of classical Taoism. If you've read the Tao Te Ching, come across it, those 40-odd writers, we sort of cobbled together under one name, Lao Tzu, which means old teacher. And they're saying that, well, if you don't really understand the Tao, it's cool, because it's like really out there, right? And also, uh, by the way, if times are tough, keep your hand down. And then the, uh, the Taoist thinker, Zhuang Tzu, his, his, uh, his funny stories, really charming, witty stories. And I never quite forgot that. How one well-placed, thoughtful joke takes us so much further than reams and reams and reams and reams and reams of academic discourse. Not that my teachers in college agreed with me, but I never did forget it. Or Confucianism, right? This uh, Kung Su we call him in Chinese, right? And all his practical steps to developing virtue. And the Confucian thinker monks a few hundred years later who said, you know, your average person is good. You can make a good person bad, but that takes an act of will on your part. Meet a stranger on the street, that person is good. Clearly, monks had not heard of original sin. So then after a few years of this, I decided I have to go see it. I'm sick of studying it. You know? I'm sick of studying and tussling with sutras, so I went. I went to, well, I knew from my studies that uh, the communists had managed to kill off classical Chinese culture. Uh, so I went to Taiwan, that large, the Republic of China, that large island off the coast of the mainland, right? And I got the you know, job as teaching English as a foreign language. That was my day job. And uh, you know, the rest of the time, I just sat and I watched and I listened. And you know what I saw? I'd go to a Buddhist temple or a Confucian temple or a Taoist temple, and I was in a church. They were praying to Buddha as God, praying to Lao Tzu as God, praying to Kong Su as God, and the prayers were exactly the same as they were back in Wisconsin. Please help me with this illness. Please help me get that job. Please help me with my kids. They're driving me insane, right? It's different language, same words. Isn't that amazing? But I still watched four years go by, right? And I decided, you know what, I really don't know as much about Christianity as I thought I did. Funny that. So, when we came back, footnote, I met my wife, Manya, there. And she's not Chinese, she's a, a Yakima farm girl. In fact, she taught me how to ride bareback and a gallop. <laughs> but when we came back, I decided I needed to study Christianity, really. So I went to seminary, right? I went to Seattle U's School of Theology and Ministry, which is one of the more challenging seminaries in the country. <clears throat> you, you tussle with all the greats there. You start with Augustine and his thoughts on desire. You go into Anselm and his thoughts on the God-man. You go to Thomas Aquinas and his Exitus Reditus, which is Latin for we exit from God and through Jesus Christ we return to God. And if you can do Thomas Aquinas, you have to go back to 
the Greeks, the classical Greeks. A lot of Aristotle who says, everything you need to know is right here. And his teacher, who said, Hui, Plato who said, everything that matters is up there. This is all a shadow. And his teacher, just a little bit Socrates, right? Those thinkers, then also some of the moderns, like, you know, more modern, like Luther and Melanchthon and Calvin, of course, and then, you know, Rahner and Tillich, the two greats of our time. And um, particularly Rahner, considered by many to be the greatest theologian of our time, and yet he gets so shy in his language when he comes to salvation. Almost as if he has some doubts about it. Well, at this time, I was starting to get plenty of doubts. I had a lot of doubts about Jesus as, as the Son of God. Even then. I'd be in class, and I'd say, oh, do anybody know what divine means? Just wondering, you know, specifically? I mean, do you ever think about What does that mean? And the teacher would go, yay, I've got Jeff in class. Let's get into this, guys. And by the end of seminar, I always had all kinds of doubts about whether God gets involved in this world at all. After all, I was looking around me at all the people who are suffering, and they're praying, and it's not helping. Nothing's happening. In fact, I, myself, I'm becoming a minister, right? I'm becoming a minister. And there I am, I stopped praying to God for help. I was praying for courage, wisdom, strength. My sermons, I would talk about God's will being so complex, it, would take, it might take us several lifetimes to understand. Clearly, this is not helpful to a woman facing breast cancer. And I realized I wasn't helping anybody, so I stopped. And I sat there, and I looked at my $70,000 pastoral, I'm oh, sorry, master's and pastoral studies degrees, and I thought, what am I going to do with that? So, ah, I went into the arts. I mean, you know, we artists, we're always coloring outside the lines and freaking people out. It made sense in a certain fashion, a certain twisted fashion. I mean, I did a lot of public service in the arts, particularly in visual arts, and, uh, and helped create a live music scene and all this other stuff. But for me as an artist, I became a writer, and particularly a playwright into theater. And I, um, un unlike almost all playwrights, my plays actually got produced. Almost 15 of them, or about 15 of them, and this is all in and around the Seattle theater scene. And this was great. I was going, I was doing really well. Except for one thing. This pebble in my shoe, which had become a stone, was becoming a really hard rock. And my plays started getting more and more complex. Because I was into Hinduism at this point. I mean, I was tussling with Shankara, arguably the greatest of all Hindu thinkers. And uh, the Bhagavad Gita, that slim little volume, like this. Cost you three dollars at any second-hand bookstore, and you can spend the next three decades of your life pondering it, right? Or getting into Islam, that fabulous story of this really talented young man who had these awful seizures, sitting in a cave, and Allah is speaking to him, and he's just writing everything down, just hoping it ends. And that's why the Quran, when we call it the book, means the recitation, right? And the religion that he founded. Islam means surrender, surrender to the will of Allah. And if you think of your average Bedouin camel raider, I bet that went down really well, that whole surrender thing, right? So, or Rabia, the Sufi poet who, who spoke of Allah as my beloved, right, in all of her poetry. I was into all that. It was showing up in all of my plays, and you know what? People did not like it. I was writing myself right out of a career as a playwright. Because it was still there. It was getting worse and worse. I couldn't get rid of it. It was occupying me morning, noon, and night. And finally, one day, you know what I did? I got really radical. I took off my shoe. And I looked inside, and you know what I saw? Made in China? Nothing. <laughs> Good though. What's your name? Me. Nate, a straight man. Yes. Nothing. I found nothing, right? I had made it up. This need to find God, this need to search for God, this need to figure out how God ticks, this need to figure out how, what the rules are, to get a handle on God. I made it all up. It was all in my mind. And that's when the thought hit me. What if God is a fantasy? What if God is a dream? I mean, a good dream, right? It stretches back several millennia. 
In my book here now, I go all the way back to Ur, right? A land long, long ago called Ur, where God-making was all the rage. And every city had their own hometown God, you know, for war, for agriculture, for fertility, for mining, you know, you name it, you know, for seawater, whatever, fishing. In fact, you can argue that had we not had that dream, that fantasy as a species, would we have made it this far on this planet? Makes you wonder. And particularly now, these days. Because that's what's different from then. Now, we do understand so much of how the world works. We understand so much of how nature works that we've actually given ourselves the capability to destroy all life on this planet. Things are different now. And perhaps then it's time to set aside that fantasy as a relic of an earlier time. That when we are faced with a problem, instead of praying to some fantasy god and asking that fantasy god to take care of the problem for us, that we pick up our wrenches and we just fix the problem ourselves. Right? Think about this a little bit longer and it'll hit you just like it hit me. Wait a minute, if that means that God is a fantasy, that also means that heaven is a fantasy. Oh, that bites. No place to go after we die? When we die, that's it? It's just gone? It's freaky. I freaked myself out and my wife for three years solid about that one. <clears throat> and then one day it dawned on me that there's a really quite natural shift that occurs in your mind. If you realize, when you realize, there is no heaven to look forward to. This is it. The focus of your life shifts. Instead of working really hard, spending your entire life working on those get into heaven rules, you know, making sure you follow them so you can get into heaven, there is no heaven. So that means forget the rules. Your focus shifts to right here, right now. Making sure, because this is what we have, this moment in time, and how we move forward moment by moment throughout our life. Right here, right now, which is why I called my book Here and Now. How do we do this? How do we explore the fullest expression of meaning in our life? That's quite a mouthful, so I'm going to say it a second time. How do we explore the fullest expression of meaning in our life? And I hope we get to talk about that during the Q&A. In the meantime, to finish up about my book, what that's what it became for me. After all these years, I started writing myself out of a playwriting career, a failure as a minister, I suddenly dawned on me, maybe I better start writing these ideas down. I mean, it's been three and a half decades now. Think about that. Three and a half decades ago, when I started this search. Maybe I better start to write the ideas down. So I did. <clears throat> and I had no idea what's going to become of it, but it started to become a book. And as I was doing this book, I realized, hey, <clears throat> it's getting a bit heavy. I need to lighten it up. So I reached back through my little sketchbooks, and ah, I found Thrash and Jack, my little cute skateboarding character. I said, perfect. And then I did Lotus, who's our cat at home, our ginger daddy. And I uh, kind of put them together into the, uh, the book. And so that's why Thrash and Jack just kind of marches right along with the entire story, all 115 comics throughout the book. And that made it lighter, and it seemed to take the text in a whole new direction. And so this book is coming to an end. It's finishing, and you know what? Big surprise in my life. People got really excited by this book. Really excited. There's a... Uh, let's see, I'm doing a radio interview next week. <clears throat> and his uh, compliment six my mind right now. He says that... Uh, he's so jazzed about it, he believes that it should be required reading for all theists. Not atheists. Theists in the country. And this is a man who's been doing this. Tom Smith has been doing this for years. He's watched a lot of books come and go. He, uh, and the fact that he sees that, it might kill a little book. That, that's really quite wonderful. And so we'll see. Perhaps here now can become my contribution to the wider conversation. And if so, I think that's great because I'm looking forward to it.
Thank you. So, your questions. Ben? I went ahead and, uh, and read the book, and, um, and since you do so much with uh, playwriting, uh, have you ever thought of doing a, a play adaptation of the book, specifically? That's a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, I think you saw in there that uh, when I first started it, and I realized, you know, this is getting really heavy. When it has a playwright, I wanted to write some serious theater. You know, do, do you know anybody in theater? We're all like that. I want, yes, yes, right? We're all, I have to do something serious. And I was getting there, and I kept thinking of Zhuang, and I was like, no, I mean, his stories, and that really thoughtful joke, well-placed joke. Don't do it. Don't, don't fall to, into temptation. So I worked on comedy. And I was not funny. <laughs> but I learned, I got better. <clears throat> so um, we see in this case, that's what I mean. I, I knew it was going to be tough at times for people. Uh, so I thought I would keep it light. And uh, maybe that's a good choice, you know, just an actual extension. You have a publisher? Yeah, I do. What's that? You have a publisher? Amazon Kindle. Nice. And then. That's the digital version, and then these days, the major print houses look for, I think it is like 5,000, 6,000, sold within a reasonable amount of time, and then they say, okay, now let's do the print version. So it's now. And then there is the Chinese publisher that is coming down the road too, so we'll see. It's one step at a time. When will it be on Kindle again? June 1st. Oh, wow. Yeah, coming fast. The reviews, the professional reviews, aren't due for a couple of weeks yet. But, uh, but again, the the first feedback is is really good. I mean, people are really surprised because it's just it's just inside my head, right? Been hanging out there for three and a half decades, slowly coming into form, and then now that I do this, and people are so excited. I mean, my wife was, but you know, Manya's. I love Manya. She loves me, and so you can't help but think, well, is she just a little biased there? What do you bring with you like, from the studies of religion that you've done? Uh, which uh, traditions hold the most value with you, uh, separate from the theology? That's an excellent question. Well, certainly drugs of the humor, because I don't think we laugh enough in life. And when it comes to finding that fullest expression of meaning in your life, I think that humor becomes a big part of it. Who does not love to laugh, right? And we get all bent out of shape, we get serious about things. But it just feels good to smile, doesn't it? So when you think about the fullest expression of meaning in this moment, I'm sure laughter's in there somewhere. <clears throat> then second, uh, guided thought. So Huinan, I'm very influenced by the Huinan school of uh, Chan Buddhism and how that went into Zen. I mean, I have my disagreements with them straight out. But uh, first of all, I would never join a school that lives off the surrounding countryside and promises people karmic merit. <laughs> But uh, that said, uh, I do believe, I have found the value of guided thought in my mind. And not just the example I gave you about the burger. You know, it can also be for, um, you know, he's not into me. Okay. Uh, my best friends are telling me, forget about him. I can't. It's, this has destroyed my life. He's not into me. How do you do that? The heart is just not rational. <laughs> Right? So that's how you do it. That's been my experience. You actually guide your thoughts. I'll give you a strange example. So here I was. It took me six hours coming out. I stopped for a little bit in Ellensburg because I, want, Ellensburg, so I wanted to check out an art gallery, the art center there. And um, what was I doing those six hours in the car? Was I listening to radio? Was I listening to a talking book? No, I was actually listening to my thoughts as I was driving. And when some sort of weird, can you imagine? When some sort of weird thought came up, I would actually just sort of guide the thought, right? Into something a little bit more, you know, I can't say a little profitable because it sounds like money, but I think you understand what I mean, right? Something more fruitful. That is the second. Third, I'm really taken with. Uh, the uh, Shankara's belief, his, uh, his interest in being itself. Shankara is the Hindu thinker I mentioned. Uh, or if you want to be formal about it, you call him Shankara Acharya. If we, when, you, when you write a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and it becomes widely accepted, you become Acharya. So Gandhi, 
when he was growing as a as a teacher, he wrote a commentary, which I disagree with entirely, by the way. But <laughs> he spiritualized it. But anyway, so uh, you write a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, and then then people call you Acharya after that, right? Just like teacher. But uh, Shankara was an interesting man. You know, he and was a very young man, and you'll love this story because he died when he was 34. Before he died, he traveled all of India at that time, this is 700 AD, and he debated the leading thinkers, the leading religious thinkers, and he trounced them, one after another. <coughs> this boy, right, when he's 17, 18, 19, 20, all through his 20s, he's doing this. He's just that gifted. So did they poison him in the end? Maybe, who knows. Those three strands of thought I'm heavily influenced by. So how would you differentiate between guided thinking and mindfulness? Or is there, would there be a difference? Or? I think mindfulness is uh, being aware of the moment. Mm -hmm. Guided thinking is where you actually step in, or you set up a guardrail in your mind when you have an errant thought. Maybe it's a lack of self-confidence. Maybe it's something that's clearly irrational. I mean, you just know it is. But we've all been there, right? This mind is really weird at times. It just sort of grabs a hold of you. It won't let go. And the older you get, the more um, comfortable you get with the idea that you're just a little bit whacked. And you actually talk about it without getting drunk first. You know? <laughs> but right, when you're, you guys are what, around 20, 21, 22? I remember, there's no way in the world I was ever going to admit that. It's like, yeah, right, get locked up in the loony bin? Are you crazy? No. But in fact, we all are, you know? And so that's, uh, guided thought is where you actually choose to guide your thinking. You say, you know, I don't think that's quite right. Let's, let's, let's send that, right? The example I gave of a broken heart, you know, she's just not into you, or he's not into you. That uh, you just force yourself, gently, because you don't want to rip your mind apart. Gently force your mind to stop thinking such thoughts and find a more fruitful way of thinking about it. For example, you know, that was a huge disappointment, but look at all the experience I got. So this makes me a more accomplished person after all, and I'm going to focus on that instead of the, whatever the failure was. Does that help? Yeah. Are you reading Thich Nhat Hanh? Is that me? Yes. No. Um, the, he's the Vietnamese monk that teaches a lot about mindfulness. That's his favorite. No, I just I just studied a little bit of Buddhism here and there. So. Okay. Um, then you're gonna have to tell me more about it. Over pizza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that, that this book isn't even like officially out yet. Uh -huh. But are you thinking of doing other books? Are you do you, do you want to take this? Well, you know, that's a good question. I mean, because it's so Christian, it's so Abrahamic. You know that term? From Abraham, right? Who comes from Ur, believe it or not. Funny that. And, uh, and he, uh, his, the god that he worshipped was a mountain god called El Shaddai. Later on, the backbreaking occurred. And, no, 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 he worshipped Yahweh. But uh, the, the um, I had to limit it. And I thought, well... When I first write this book, it's probably going to be read in America. So let's, let's just do the Abrahamic religions and see how that line of thinking has come forward from Ur, you know, through all the polytheistic phase to right down to the one true God idea through Zor uh, Zoroaster. And um, if there's going to be a second book, I think it probably will be more Asian focused. It'd be a, a Buddhist and Taoist and um, a little bit Confucianist, but Kongsa wasn't interested in gods. He, he, he was just like, just do, do the rituals and get on with it. You know? Get back to developing virtue. I was kind of going to ask, it may have been a little extremely open-ended and maybe a little too soon to think about it, but I was going to ask, like, what now? I mean, you've traveled halfway across the world and you know, you've discovered all this stuff. I mean, have you thought about, I mean, well, I mean, cause book, maybe a book, or have you thought about any other future thoughts or plans or anything like that? Or? Well, I think, um, as we go forward, what I'm learning that more and more people want to hear about that. Remember that mouthful I talked about? Exploring, right? The fullest expression of meaning in your life. That sounds like, whoa, a bungee jumping or something like that? No, no, no. It's actually really quite simple. 
Um, and I'm finding that more and more people are interested in hearing about this. It's so simple, in fact, that anybody can do it. It's like chewing gum. It's called a fullness circle. You get together with a group of people that you trust most, your best friends, maybe four, five people together, and you begin. You speak for 10 minutes about how you've been exploring the fullest expression of meaning in your life since the last time you saw them. Things you've tried, you know, what worked, what didn't work, things you're thinking about trying, but you're not quite sure about yet. And you do this for 10 minutes, and then you stop, because that's a lot right there. Then for the following five minutes, any of your friends who wants to asks you questions to help clarify, to help you bounce ideas off of them. Because you've noticed that, haven't you? The most complex thoughts we have in our minds, we need somebody that we trust to bounce ideas off of to really understand them, right? That's what this is. That goes on for five minutes, and then that stops. That's 15 minutes on you. Wow. Oof. For most people, that's a lot right there. And who's to the next person? She does a 10, and then the five, and so on. You just go right around the circle, and then when you're done, after an hour, an hour and a half of this, your group's going to be a little bit tired, but really quite exhilarated. And then, the best part happens. You've got a whole week to think about this. Think about what you talked about this last week, this last time, before you see them again, and then you pick up those topics again. Continue meet, continuing to meet like that, and with your fullness circle, you will find that little changes occur in your life. The first will be so small, you won't even see them happen. The later ones will become larger and larger, and then really large. For example, you will be walking someday on that planet of this solar system that you want to. Or you will take care of that 80-year-old down the street that everyone seems to forget about. You will write that poem, or paint that painting, or carve that sculpture that you want to. Or you will have that child and raise that child well as an act of hope in a struggling world. Right? You will get that dream job. Those larger changes come later as, as a result of this. I think that's what's happening to me next. To answer your question, yeah. what now? Well, what's the fullest expression of meaning in my life? Right now, at first it was to write that book, and then because I wrote the book, the more I kept thinking about it, now it's becoming helping people develop fullness circles. Because again, <clears throat> it's easy. Anybody can do it. It's like chewing gum. And you can do it anywhere. You can do it in your living room. You can do it at a coffee shop, right? Because these are your friends. There's nothing formal about it. You don't have to go to some building. You don't have to fill out a form. You don't have to start writing checks to some organization. This is something you just do. And because they see the same thing that you do. Each of us comes accessorized with an expiration date, right? We don't know what that date is. We just know we're going to run into it at some point. So knowing that God's a fantasy, knowing that heaven is a fantasy, the focus shifts from that hazy heaven that we, we're going to go to after we die to right here, right now. This is the moment that I have. This is the moment I need to use. How am I going to do that? And that's where the phone circle comes in. Cool. Thank you. Good? I got a I'm brimming on questions here. Sam Harris, does he, I mean, you sound like him in terms of... Sorry? Sam Harris, did you... Sam Harris. Uh, he's, he's an atheist who's got, who's had some involvement with the Eastern, um, Eastern meditation and so on. Um, he spent like 18 hours a day meditating for, you know, a couple of weeks. Oh good, maybe I'll look him up. <clears throat> yeah. You, Did you have a question about him? I just wanted to see if that was an influence on you. Um, and it, but I think you'd like him. Um, I tend to read the originals. Uh, I don't really like reading commentaries because then I have to read through a filter. Okay. I, it's harder to pick up. You know, it's hard, to, it's hard to pick up Shankara. Mm -hmm. It's hard to pick up Hoi Nung. And you're going to say, well, what do you say? It's hard to pick up Asai and Dogen. I mean, but, you know, once you struggle with it, after a while, you know, it becomes worth it. 
Um, your wife, where is she on this journey with you? A lot of times when these changes happen, the both partners don't always move at the same pace or even in the same direction. You know, I found that true as well. Uh, she's pretty much right where I am. She was never happy about me becoming a minister, but because she loved me, she agreed to go along. And I remember when I told her that this isn't working, I need to stop. She did this. <laughs> Interestingly, her parents, her extended family, are fundamentalists in Yakima. And these are salt of the earth people. I mean, really good people. These are like leaders of the community. These are the good people, right? But they are fundamentalists. So you can imagine what they think of us. Next Thanksgiving dinner is very interesting. So what about your family? My family are political activists. They couldn't care less about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, do you follow the Psilocybin Project? Are you familiar sorry? With it? The Psilocybin Project? I'm sorry, could you say I don't... I, I said, uh, do you follow... Psilocybin Project? Uh, I what? Really don't. Apparently not. <laughs> hey, do you know what Psilocybin is? Did you ever take mushrooms in your college? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna start! <laughs> yes? No. No? Oh, well, they, uh, Johns Hopkins University has been leading this thing for like the past decade. And um, they've been using these mushrooms that have been illegal for a while, but were used. I mean, you're, are you familiar with them at all? They've been used in. Well, I mean, I remember uh, indigenous cultures for like a Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember they were real big in the 70s, and I remember. Yeah, the theory, theory was, was one of the Western first Western culture then, but they were gone for a long time when the Christians came okay. to the states and freaked out about them and kind of said, "Hey, does everyone stop doing that." And just kind of disappeared off the off the map for a while. Okay, but they were there for a long time before that. And John, you're asking Hawkins, me whether I should try. It? No, <laughs> this is this is related to what you were talking about because it, it the the studies that they've been doing kind of have a lot of the same conversations and a lot of the same ideas about retraining your brain and. So it doesn't. Patterns and, so taking the stimulant helps you. No, it's not a stimulant. Um, taking the, the way, hallucinogenics. The helps way you. that the way that they describe it is, it's more of instead of taking a drug okay. to solve your problem, it's a drug that you take that helps you solve the problem yourself, because it changes the way that you can think about something and perceive something. And so people that get really bogged down in depression, anxiety, have a lot harder time kind of freeing their mind into a meditative state. It's kind of like a drug-induced meditative state at the right dose in a controlled environment. So I'm and guessing that you know people who've had good results with this? Yeah, and, and okay. I, I've been following it for a long time, and they... Um, I'll they, have to say that I, I would be really uncomfortable with it, and I know I won't do something like that. Oh, you don't have to do drugs. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not advocating new drugs. So not for that reason. It's for a different reason entirely. What's that? I believe that we, we go farther to a deeper level when we train our minds ourselves, when we actually tussle with our minds. Sometimes the mind can be a pretty frightening place, right? You just, uh, you're, you, you get terrified at your own rage. That's, I don't have rage, I'm a good person, <laughs> right? You know, that kind of thing. And, but no, 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 everybody does at some point or other. And to learn to deal with that, right? Or depression. I don't get depressed. I'm a, I'm a happy person, I'm a well-adjusted person, you know? Um, it is true, some people truly, their chemical receptors are not functioning in the brain. And so they do need to take some sort of, they need some sort of chemical correction. But my belief is, I would really like to see us all try guiding our thoughts ourselves a lot further before we go to something chemical or an additive like that. Yeah, this would be one of those things that they took once. Not, not something they took every time, but they did it with uh, cancer cancer patients that had had, had a you know a life sentence on them, had a six month term or whatever, and um, and they, they took this drug for cancer anxiety and were able to become more kind of content with their life and and kind of ease their transition as they were you know dying from this illness or later cured from it, but it they're they're just kind of everything that they had to say about their life just kind of went Interesting. Up after it. They became much more content. And they've been using it, they've been doing studies to treat uh, I'm gonna hold that thought. addiction. You can tell me more about it later. Okay. Other questions? Um, the I really like the part in 
hadn't ever actually seen this before uh, about the morality. And you said that, uh, of course, God outlines the morality we think we should follow because we invented him. So what else would he have outlined? That's right. That's the question. It comes up repeatedly. The morality question. If you haven't heard it already, you will hear it many, many times in the years ahead. That uh, if you don't believe in God, how can you be a moral person? Right? But that gets it all backwards because... We created our morality, and then we assigned a God to champion it, or to represent it, right? So, of course, and morality changes over time. So, of course, back then in the classical era, slavery was acceptable. Not just acceptable, it was desirable, because it was a, it was a core part of the economy. And so, of course, the gods of that time said, yes, slavery's a good thing. Today, we don't think slavery's a good thing. So, of course, our gods say, no, slavery's a bad thing. Right? The morality comes first, and the God comes second. So why should we get upset? In fact, we created our morality. Well, let's just own it. Nothing to be worried about. We're coming to the natural end. Let me thank you again. This is really a lot of pleasure. I particularly like hearing your thoughts. So I don't know what happens here. Do you guys go out after order or something like that? If so, or whatever, then, you know, that's cool. And. Um, Look forward to talking with you some more. Thanks again. Thank you. I'm going to have some that How is that different from CBT? Uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy. It's more of a, it's like they would do CBT when they. Yeah. So you take a dog and then you do CBT.